I would ask you today to turn your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Amen. Preaching through this for some time now. One of the things that, of course, those of you who have been here for a while know, and maybe just let our visitors know this, is that, of course, that we believe in what's called the expository preaching of God's Word, which means that we take the book of the Bible and we begin at chapter 1 and verse 1 and we preach all the way through it. And uh, had a conversation with a uh, man last night on the phone concerning this and, and uh, just kind of confirmed something that I uh, already, I think I already knew, but that this is not common the expository preaching of God's Word. It ought to be common. It ought to be done in every church is my personal opinion. That's the way that pastors ought to teach. But, we come this morning to, as we said, to chapter 5, and, and we spoke last week in chapter 5. We began with verse 17, and uh, spoke on verses 17 and 19. I'm going to read those verses again, but read down through verse 20 today because really the context of all of this is still dealing with this issue of, of elders or pastors and Paul's instruction concerning elders and pastors. And he's giving some practical things here. but They're, they're practical, but they're also spiritual. Uh, just because they're practical doesn't mean they're spirit, not spiritual. So we're going to read this morning and, and to complete this section that deals really here with the elders or the pastors of the church. Begin with verse 17, 1 Timothy 5. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. <clears throat> Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, but the rest also may fear. So to give a recap really of what we talked about last week, we talked about that those who... <coughs> our elders or pastors, and there's several different words that are used in the Scripture that talk really the same office. There's the word elder, there's the word pastor or pastor teacher, and the word bishop. And it all really speaks of the same office. And what Paul instructs Timothy, and for Timothy to instruct those that are under his teaching, is those who rule well, those who labor well and rule well as pastors and elders that they are worthy of double honor. Uh, that they are worthy of an honor because of their calling, because of their uh, dedication to the Word of God and to the ministry of the church. They are worthy of this, this double honor. Uh, and this, this has to do with, as I said last week, it's not only about that we honor them personally, we honor them in practical ways. And, and as he gets down there to talk about the laborers worthy of his wages, that the idea here also, that word, those words there speak of, of the financial support of those who it, whose calling and job it is is to minister the Word of God. As I said last week, I believe this, that the, the main calling of the pastor or elder is the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. That is his main calling. It's not that he, he's not to ever call upon the sick, not that he's not ever to make a home visitation to someone, but his main calling, first and foremost, is the study of God's Word and prayer and then the preaching and teaching of God's Word. If you remember in early in the, in the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6, there got to be a murmuring among the widows because they weren't being taken care of. And so then... Uh, they established what we call, or at least what we think of as the office of deacon, to serve in that capacity. And, uh, and they said the reason for this, this is really not our calling is to do that, but our calling is to give ourselves continually to prayer and the study of the Word. And so that's, I believe, the primary calling is, 
is for the primary job of the pastor elder is to prayer and the study of the word and then the preaching and the ministry of the word of God. But Paul says here that these are worthy of double honor and he gives an illustration there from the Old Testament. He says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Uh, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Uh, you know, I don't mind being compared to a laborer. I'm not sure how I feel about being compared to an ox as a, uh, as a, as a minister of the Lord. But his idea was there is that those that labor, even the animals that labor, you feed them. And you take care of them. And so the church, in honor of those that labor in the Word of God, you are to honor them uh, with financial support and to help them. And so that really brings us today to uh, really another issue here that, that Paul speaks of. And he says here, beginning with verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Now, in, in this section of Scripture, Paul addresses accusations that are brought against elders, and then also, if those accusations are found to be true, the discipline of elders. Now, we've spoken of, of church discipline before. And let me say this, that there is biblical teaching concerning church discipline. Now, there, to be perfectly honest, there's not many churches around anymore that practice what we call church discipline or biblical church discipline. I read the passage this morning, Matthew chapter 18. Jesus believed in church discipline. Uh, he said in this case, as you saw there, that if there is an issue between two brothers... Go there one on one. If he doesn't hear in the one on one, uh, I don't know, I don't, like, don't want to maybe call it a discussion, maybe a confrontation. I'm not sure. Then if they won't, he won't hear that. Then you take two or three witnesses. If he won't hear that, then you bring it before the church. If he won't hear that, then basically you exercise church discipline. The Apostle Paul, we know of over in uh, 1 Corinthians, we understand in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that there was sexual immorality going on in the church. And, you know, we don't take that lightly. That when there is, uh, when sin is brought out in, in the eyes of the church, when that becomes uh, known in the church, it needs to be dealt with. Paul said, you know, you need to deal with this. He says, you've really not dealt with this church of Corinth. You've basically just really gloried in it. You've just sort of let them, let's just let it go. Maybe it'll go, I don't know what their thinking was in that. And really, I think sometimes the, the mindset of the church today was, well, that's not really any of, our, any of our business. We should just, you know, maybe it'll just go away on its own. Well, no, the church is precious to the Lord. It is a holy body. And Scripture teaches uh, a little leaven which represents sin. A little sin affects all of the body. I mean, you can have a perfectly healthy body except for maybe a little tumor that's cancerous. You want to say, well, we're just going to ignore that and maybe it'll go away. No, you would not do that. You would deal with that because it basically would affect the whole body eventually. And that's the way that it is with the church, that those things must be dealt with. Now, in regards to accusations against elders, Paul desires, here he has very clear guidelines. Now, let me say this. The calling, I believe, of, of a man to ministry, to be an elder or pastor, is a very serious calling. Uh, there are great responsibilities uh, with that. And I think to some extent there is a different level of accountability there. He is one that leads the flock. He is a shepherd of the flock. And there I think is a more strict uh, level of judgment there. In fact, if you look at the book of James in chapter 3 verse 1, 
Uh, James said there, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive what? A stricter judgment. <coughs> Pastors are under a microscope. They are viewed more closely by the body. And in some senses, this is as it should be in some ways. Because they have a responsibility uh, to the body. And certainly if the head of the body or if the pastor of the body is, is uh, guilty of some sin, it is certainly, certainly going to affect the body. Uh, now let me say this. When he says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses, let me say this. Those often in positions I have seen, and as many of all, just I guess all of you know, that I'm, I was also a pastor's kid, not just a pastor. So I've seen this basically my whole life, that those in positions of spiritual leadership are very often in danger of false accusations. And... The hard part about that is, is very often people are prone to believe a false accusation above what is truthful. Uh, you know, we have in our day, out in our culture with all the social media and everything, uh, things that are spoken out there that are not truth, but people believe it, and then before... Uh, the truth can come along and dispel that untruth, then it spreads like wildfire. And that happens very often, unfortunately, within the church. Are elders, now let me ask this question, are elders capable of great sin? Well, yes, elders are capable of great sin. But again, it seems very often that people are quick to believe the worst of God's men even when the claims are false and unsubstantiated. And we see this in the Scriptures, do we not? Where godly men are accused falsely uh, by others and the false accusation is believed. You look at Joseph. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He chose what God pleased instead of what she desired. He suffered the consequences for it. Moses was falsely accused. David was falsely accused. Jeremiah the prophet was falsely accused. And ultimately, our Lord Jesus Christ was falsely accused. Even though there was never any sin or any guile uh, associated with him, he never committed any sin, he was falsely accused. Those false accusations were believed. Now why does this occur? Well, sometimes it occurs due to envy. Envy within, you know, of others, uh, of the pastor. Sometimes it is jealousy. Sometimes, unfortunately, I've seen this, it's the desire, a desire for power among someone in the church body that is ungodly. And simply sometimes it's because of a hatred for righteousness and truth. There is always, let me say this, there is always going to be a conflict between those that are unrighteous and those that are righteous. There will never be a peace there. They are at enmity one against the other. So what Paul says is that when these accusations come, they must be handled in a biblical manner. A biblical manner. Everything that we do within the church should be done in a biblical manner, not because that's the way Baptists have always done it. Very often what I've seen in our day and time is that, well, we need to appoint a committee and let them deal with this. Or well, those Deacons, they are the bosses of the pastor. They need to handle it. And <laughs> Number one, deacons are not the bosses of the pastor. Deacons are servants. That's what the Bible points out. And so Paul, what he is commanding here is a biblical way to deal with this subject. 
Now he says, do not receive uh, an accusation. And, and, and the word receive here means to embrace with favor. If somebody comes along to you and makes some kind of condemnation or accusation, which is what accusation there means in the original language, about the pastor. And they come up beside you, they get on the phone, and they say, hey, you know, I've got something here I'm, uh, about Brother Weber. I'm just using myself for an example. Let me say this. Number one, do not believe immediately the worst. That's what Paul is saying here. He says, do not receive these accusations except against an elder, except from two or three witnesses. They say, well, why is Paul? Is this just something that Paul pulled out of the air? Well, obviously it is not. We just read Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus talks about taking two or three together, two or three going forward uh, to talk with someone who has offended someone else. But, but Paul, what I want to say here is that Paul's recommendation about this is based upon Scripture. If you go back to the Old Testament, and back in Deuteronomy, under the law, there were way, ways of dealing with recommendations. I mean, accusations. There were these recommendations about how you deal with accusations. If you go to, to Deuteronomy chapter 17, and verse 6. Now, here... Uh, Moses is writing here about wicked things that occur and the worship of uh, false gods uh, and those things that were deserving of death. And in verse 6 he said here, Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony what? of one witness. In other words, that, that does away with this idea that you can have one person that makes a false accusation against another person and judgment is carried out based on just the one witness. He said there must be two or three witnesses. Chapter 19 and verse 15. He says basically the same thing. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits by the mouth of two or three witnesses the matter shall be established. We already read over in Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus spoke of taking two or three witnesses. When you speak to someone where there is a, a matter to be discussed that involves church discipline. In John chapter 18, there in verses 16 and 17, Excuse me, I've got the wrong passage there. But it speaks there again of two or three witnesses. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. Paul says there, but this will be the third time I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Then you go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 28. In the writer of Hebrews here says, reaffirms what is taught in the Old Testament. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So Paul is stating that which is biblical. Not pulling out his own opinion about how this ought to be done, but he's saying this is the biblical way that you deal with this. Handling these accusations in this manner is what? To serve what is right and just and to prevent a false accusation against a pastor from harming his ministry and the ministry of the church. I have known of pastors who have been accused of things and whose ministries have been ruined on the basis of one accusation. And God only knows whether sometimes whether that accusation is, 
It's false or not. I knew of a pastor who was a faithful minister of God's Word. An accusation was made against him. He eventually ended up having to leave the church. It ruined his ministry at that church. He denied the accusation, but, but his reputation was ruined within the church. And it did harm to the church. What Paul said needs to be needs to be followed. Needs to be followed closely. And let me say this, those who would think of falsely accusing a pastor need to remember Psalm 105 verse 15 that says, Do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. If someone makes a false accusation against a pastor, God will deal with that. There will be judgment. Then, Paul says, Regarding that, okay, you have the two or three witnesses. You don't receive the accusation against the elder except from two or three witnesses. But he says, those who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all, the rest also may fear. So, supposing the accusation turns out to be true, that there is sin involved in the life of the pastor, that turns out to be true. Paul instructs them what to do when they are found guilty regarding an accusation. Now I want you to remember, there's two things that we need to remember here. Number one, God's standards for leadership are very high. We examined those standards for leadership in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It is somebody, the standards there basically are for somebody who must basically be above reproach. Holy. Not only in regards to doctrine, right in regards to doctrine, but right in regards to his personal life. The manner of his life. The Apostle Paul, when he left Ephesus, he says in, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, remember this, that you are shepherding the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Many pastors need to remember that. Then, in Ephesians chapter 4, we read this passage before, but he talks about the calling of the pastor there in verse 11 and the giving of some to be pastor, teachers and prophets and evangelists. But he says, for what? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's a high calling. That is a calling that no pastor teacher should ever take seriously. But if he is found guilty of some sin, then he has disqualified himself from being able to do that. Depends on the sin, I think. But really, I think the, the sense here that Paul is teaching that, that this is something serious that comes about. But it is a high calling. It, the, the standard is very high. Because the responsibility is so high. And then secondly, let me say this. Elders are still in the flesh. They are capable of great sin. <clears throat> Not an elder, but David was said to be a man after God's own heart. He was the king of Israel. And yet he, as we all know, was guilty of great sin in his life. Peter was guilty, not of a sexual immorality, but as we will see as we'll look at some of the scriptures, he was guilty of some sin in regards to the body of Christ. Let me say this in regards to the body. It is your duty if, if at some point in my life, and I pray that this never happens, that if I become guilty of some great sin, it is your responsibility to deal with it in a biblical manner, as it is with any pastor. We value the church above the man. We value the church and Christ in the name of Christ above the man. We are never to idolize a preacher to the point of ignoring sin in his life or ignoring doctrinal error, error. I have known people that idolize certain preachers and pastors. 
remember this phrase. I've heard Alistair Begg use it many times. I think he was quoting Hudson Taylor, actually, when he said it. He said, the best of men are men at best. The best of men are men at best. Pastor Elder still sin. Just ask the pastor's family. You need any confirmation of that. But when there is an accusation, and there's sin, and that's really... When he speaks of those, those who are sinning, it is really the idea here, the word in the original language, is the habitual practice of sin. This is really what he's talking about here. Somebody, a pastor, elder, that is committing sin, and he's committing it over and over again without repentance, basically. And so he says here, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all. It is a serious offense to God. What he's saying here. This is something serious before the eyes of God and before the congregation, I think. Very often, unfortunately, it's before it gets aired before the whole congregation. But really, in a sense, it needs to get aired before the whole congregation. You know, I've seen some sometimes in the past, you know, oh, let's just kind of keep this quiet and we'll keep it hush hush. No. That's the opposite of what Paul says we should do here. It's a serious thing. It's not some minor offense. We're not, we're not talking about a, an elder being disciplined because I've, I've had people that, that have gotten mad over trivial things and me and over other pastors. Well, you didn't speak to me when I left out of church this morning. You didn't say good morning. You didn't give me a phone call, you know, about something that I thought you should have known about. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking here about serious sin. We're talking about that which is meant to have serious consequences. We're talking about a breaking, really, here of God's law that He's talking about. That's really what this means here. But it's meant to have serious, it's meant to have serious consequences. You know, as what? What uh, we read that scripture, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17, let it be to use a heathen and a publican. You say, well, that doesn't sound very loving. Discipline is loving. When I disciplined my children when they were growing up, I did it because I loved them. Not because I hated them, but because I loved them. And the church, if it handles church discipline, in the right way, there should be a brokenheartedness about it. There should be a brokenness about it that we're even having to do this. But the purpose of it is to restore that offending one back to the Lord and back to the church. And I think in the case of an elder, it is the same way that there should be, it should be done in a way to hopefully restore that one, to deal with that sin. Let me say this. Paul had already put into practice this very thing here that he's talking about. And I mentioned Peter. I'll go look, if you would, at Galatians chapter 2 and verses 11 through 14. Peter was a great, I believe, great preacher. We all understand the Apostle Peter was, was prone to some things. He was prone to, to speaking rashly and making boasts of which he was not able to, to fulfill. We know that he, he denied the Lord three times. He cursed his name. We understand that. And then the Lord restored him. Preached that great sermon on the day of Pentecost. But then later on, we find an incident that occurs. So you look at Galatians 2, verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. What was he to be blamed about? For before certain men came from James, that is from Jerusalem, Jews, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, when these Jews came, 
he withdrew and he separated himself and he feared those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews saw his behavior. They also, as he says here, played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy with Peter and the rest of them's hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Jews and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Let me say this. Paul called him on the carpet. He was wrong. He was being a hypocrite. He was in Antioch. Gentiles, he would sit, he would fellowship with the Gentiles, he would eat with the Gentiles, I was assuming, eating the same things that they did. But when the Jews got there from Jerusalem, from James, and James's contingent, oh, he withdrew himself from them. And when others, including Barnabas and others, saw his behavior, they, they did the same thing. They played the hypocrite. They were guilty of hypocrisy. I believe that, I'll be honest with you, I believe that Paul did this in the presence of all. He got in Peter's face. If you want to use that term, he got in Peter's face. He said, Paul, he said, Peter, you're wrong in this. You're being a hypocrite in this. And he needed to be called on it. That needed to be pointed out. We need to not be afraid to call sin, sin, even in the lives of elders and pastors. He was rebuked openly. And the same word that is used here for rebuke is the same word that Paul uses when, uh, when Paul teaches Timothy to, to when he's preaching the word to rebuke, to use rebuke. It's the same word. It's a strong word. I don't think, I don't think rebuke is to be a subtle thing. I think rebuke is to be an open thing. I think it's to be a very straightforward thing. This is, you know, there, there needs to be, is what he's talking about here, there needs to be consequences of discipline. Discipline, sin, has consequences. I'm a believer. My sins have been forgiven for eternity. But if I sin in this life, there are consequences for sin. Can God forgive me of those consequences? Abs I mean, forgive me for that sin? Absolutely. But sometimes I have to bear the burden of those consequences. When David committed his great sin, did he get forgiven? Yes. Read Psalm 51. He was forgiven. But there were consequences from that sin. And in the midst of that, what you do is you seek God's grace and mercy and restoration. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there are consequences. Paul talked about that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There in, in verses 4 and 5 when this, uh, this situation uh, came about there. He said, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my, my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That person was put out of the church. Now the evidence we have in 2 Corinthians is that person repented and came back to the church, as we should do if somebody repents of their sin and comes back. But as Paul says there, as we, as we see here, the purpose of this is, he says, not just for that person, but he says also that the rest also may fear. Hmm. Fear. Is fear a biblical term? Are we to fear God? You better believe it. Fear that is spoken of in the scriptures of reverential awe. When we sing like a song like How Great Thou Art, we are speaking about a God that is far above us. A God that is omnipotent, that is omniscient, that is absolutely holy. Now, we understand that as his children, 
He loves us as a father loves his child. But there is also a respect and a reverence there and a fear to some respect. When I was a child, I knew that my father loved me. I knew that. But I also knew that I needed to fear him because if I did wrong, that there would be consequences in that. But the fear that is spoken of here is a reverential fear before God. And sometimes those within the church need to see what happens in regard to sin, in regards to others, to reinforce that reverential awe and fear of God. I would have to go no farther than Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? They lied before the church. They lied before God about the sale and the giving of money to the church. They were both struck dead. And what we hear read in verse 5 of chapter 5 of Acts is that Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And then in verse 11, his wife comes along. She does not know that he's dead. We're told in verse 10 that immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men carried in, came in and found her dead and carried her out to be buried by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church, upon all who heard these things. I think if there was a more biblical way of dealing with church discipline as what Paul is talking about here, if we dealt with this in this way, that it would cause others perhaps who were guilty of sin to seek God more earnestly. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the Scripture teaches us. There should be, I believe, in our minds as God's children as a church, the fear of God. That there are consequences for sin. Paul said in another place, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness. What? In the fear of God. The fear of God spurs us, I believe, to practical holiness. <coughs> Seeking to walk with the Lord. We believe in what's called practical sanctification in this church. That means practical holiness. If we have a healthy fear of God, a right fear of God, I believe that that spurs us toward that. And I really think the point of, of Paul's teaching here is that to know that elders are held really to a higher standard even than those that are within the church. They are, they are capable of sin. And that when they do commit sin, the church needs to deal with that in a way that the rest before them may fear, may fear the Lord and seek Him more earnestly, I believe, is what Paul's teaching is here. We'll stop there today in regard to this, but I hope that we will consider these things not to view of them as... as as harsh, but of that which is right in the eyes of God, and that which promotes holiness and fear in the lives of God. May we bow our heads.